Hi, I'm Jenna McGregor, Senior Editor at Forbes. I'm here at the Milken Global Institute Conference with Pete Stavros, who is the newly named, well, since February, right, co-head of Global Private Equity at KKR. Did I get that right? That's right, you got it right. That's right, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, but most people, I think, who have heard your name also identify you with your efforts around employee ownership. You've really been very vocal, very involved. You've even uh, founded and are chairman of a nonprofit aimed at trying to get the employees of your private equity firms, uh, the portfolio companies, um, yep. you know, giving them equity, right? So that is not something that I think the typical person identifies with private equity, giving equity away, giving, giving money away, really. Um, to employees. Tell me a little bit about how that's helped to shape, you know, reshape the, the reputation of private equity. I don't know what it's done or will do for the reputation of the industry. It's honestly not why we're doing it. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's good for workers and, by the way, happens to be good for companies and shareholders too. And so when we say employee ownership, what we're talking about, just to be clear, is giving workers free a free incremental benefit, which is stock in their company. Not a trade for wages, not a trade for benefits. We're not asking them to invest out of pocket. It's free and the payoff to the company is, when it's done well, enhanced culture. Meaning people are less likely to quit, they're more engaged on, on the job. And when I say when it's done well, it's about way more than just giving out ownership. It's got to be paired with a really robust effort around employee engagement financial literacy, information sharing, bringing people into the business as partners, sharing the business plan, where are we headed? And how is what you're doing every day as a worker contributing to our overall uh, trajectory as a, as a company? So when all of that's done well, we have found it's good for everybody, good for companies, investors, and workers alike. So but the amounts of money, we're amounts of equity that we're talking about are not small. I mean, in some cases, they are life-changing amounts, right? I mean, one of the things I remember recently, Bank of America actually gave out um, some equity to tellers and like broad-based employees. And I remember asking a lot of people, why don't we see this more from the public from public companies? And one of the things you hear is, you know, it's it's they don't want it. They they want more money. They want more base pay. They want more salary. It does. It's is that because it's not big enough to make an impact? We do find that, so we've done this for, been working on this for 14 years. Yeah. We've done this 30 times. Every time we learn, we're still learning. But our, our belief is that if you're not showing someone a path to earning 100% of their income over a period of five years, it isn't enough to really move the needle. It's not enough to capture and keep their attention over our typical investment horizon. So I do think it's hard if a company, and I don't know the specifics of, of Bank of America, but if a company were to say, hey, we want to make everyone an owner, we want to give everyone $1,000 of stock, I don't think that's probably worth all of the administrative burden, communication, right. and effort. I think ownership has to be significant, and it's got to be a, a, a really a philosophy. Again, much more than just, here's $1,000 yeah. of stock. Mm -hmm. It's changing the way you operate. It's a lot of work. And give it, so get, Break it down of, of like an example. I mean, we're not just talking CEOs and managers. We're talking about factory floor workers, truck drivers, you know, anybody in the company. That's right. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, a, a company that we invested in is called CHI Overhead Doors, manufactures garage doors. When we bought the business, there were about a thousand people in the company. 18 had stock ownership. Mm -hmm. Most of it was in the hands of two people. And that's typically what we see. Stock ownership in the range of 1% to 2% of employees, and that's it. When we bought the business, safety was poor, morale was terrible. We did an engagement survey. Only 30% of people bothered to respond to the survey because they thought no one's going to listen to me anyway. Huh. And 90% of results were below the, the benchmark level. Fast forward eight years, so this does not happen overnight. Right. but. Had a new leadership team, a new strategy, uh, changed a lot of things in the business, taught financial literacy, hmm. uh, taught basic financial education, shared information, gave, gave people decision-making rights. 
more control over their work, lots of things happen. But over eight years, quit rate went down, engagement scores went up, productivity went up, the company found all sorts of ways to win market share, investors had a huge gain, and kind of to your point, what did it mean for workers? We did have truck drivers make almost $800,000. $800,000. We had factory workers who had been with us, uh, had been with the company for the longest period of time, make six and a half times their annual income. Even people who had just joined the prior year made forty thousand dollars. So, wow. it was it was to your point a meaningful amount a meaningful of money. Meaningful amount of money, yeah. So when you come into a company and you tell them they're going to do this, are, are some of the first questions a little bit of doubtful? Like, why don't you just you know pay us more income? Why don't you you know give us more base pay? I mean, is it is it a hard sell at all? This idea when you are first working with a new company. There's a lot of confusion, mm -hmm. and there's definitely some skepticism mm -hmm. or cynicism yeah. of, hey, I've, I've read about private equity, I've seen this before. Sometimes the company might have been owned by private equity beforehand. Yep. So there is a multi-year process of earning trust, mm -hmm. and there's specific ways we do that. So you know, we get a lot of input. What's not good about the job? We act on that input, and when I say we, the leadership team does all the hard work. So the CEO and the leadership team will make a commitment on, hey, we heard in the engagement surveys, these are the top three issues. They're gonna be fixed in six months. And people say, yeah, right. Yep. And then they're fixed. Mm -hmm. And then there's the next three issues and they're fixed. And then the next three issues. And the CEO says, you're gonna see us investing in this plant, manufacturing plant like you've never seen before. And they're, yeah, right. And then he does it or she does it. And so over time, that trust is built. And then people start to say, Maybe I should look at this stock thing. Maybe uh -huh. this is real. Yep. And then dividends start to get paid out on the stock. And then, and then there's a snowball. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of time, that's what really, that's the magic in moving the culture. Now, one of the things you're trying to do with this nonprofit opportunity works. Ownership works. Ownership works, thank you. Is um, get your peers to follow the same model, to get more private equity, more investment firms to do the same thing. How, how has it been a tar hard sell? Are you, you know, getting a good response? What kind of commitment are you getting? So we have uh, about 25 private equity firms already signed up. Some major firms like TPG, uh, Leonard Green, Berkshire Partners, Silver Lake, Warburg Pincus, some of the biggest names. Lots of middle market firms as well in there. And what are they actually committing to? What they're committing to is to roll this model out in at least three companies over the first 18 months of their membership in Ownership Works. And there's a contract that Ownership Works okay. and they sign and there's standards. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna ask workers to invest out of pocket. You're not gonna ask them to sacrifice wages or benefits. You're gonna share specific data back to Ownership Works around demographics of your workforce, engagement scores, um, you know, what's going on inside, inside the company so that we can then do academic research oh on what's being effective, uh, what's not working, mm -hmm. and overall impact that we're measuring. So we wanna know where the stock is going, what levels of the organization, when payouts happen, et okay. cetera. So that's what they're agreeing to. We have a wait list of, um, I believe it's something like 240 firms that have expressed interest uh, in joining. And are, and are in a wait list pattern. We only have mm -hmm. 25 people at Ownership Works. Okay. And we have already 25 members, each of whom are, yep. you know, putting at least three companies on the program. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, it's many more. For Leonard Green and others, it's many more Berkshire okay. Partners. Okay. So the team's drowning in right. work, which right. is good. That's good. Uh, so then we will be figuring out who else is serious about joining, really committed to this. Yep. And understands how hard this is. This yep. is. It sounds so easy. You just give ownership but, and good things happen. But that's a good point. Is it different, the idea of like true long-term employee ownership versus here's some, here's some equity? Yeah, it's so different. Okay. Okay. So, so, we, so what are you doing? Is this long-term employee ownership or is it just here's a benefit? Here's, a, here's an equity grant that, yeah. you know. Yeah. It, that would still be a nice thing to do. Yep. But it would not make people feel respected mm -hmm. and trusted and like they have a voice in their work and it wouldn't lead to higher productivity and better corporate outcomes. So as fiduciaries of capital, it would be dilutive to our shareholders, our investors. Yeah. So, and you know, we have to, 
yes, we want to do good, but we also have to be good stewards of, of capital. So it is complicated. As we were talking about earlier, day one, there's a lot of, you know, yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. But then beyond that, okay, you get an employee engagement survey back and the results are bad. What do you do? How do you, how do you deal with 40% of Americans quit their job every year? That's an insane statistic. That means companies are, are rehiring their whole workforce every two and a half years. That's crazy. Yeah, so when absolutely. you talk to a CEO and you say, how are you going to stop that? That's what we're trying to help with. So what we are trying to do is take traditional problem solving skills, which are tried and true. Like if you have a scrap or a productivity problem in, in a plant, there's a very clear way to fix that. Mm -hmm. A lot of those same skills can be applied to why people are quitting. And we're trying to work with, and I can take you through the details of that if you're interested. We're trying to work with CEOs to apply those skills to issues around culture. Now. We're obviously heading into, we're de all dealing with a lot of more uncertain economic times. I'm sure that it depends on the company, what kind of labor market you're seeing, but what kind of impact is this having right now with you know, continued labor shortages and some of the, the companies that you're investing in? Tell me, tell me what you're seeing in terms of the, the way this impacts like labor shortage problems you're having. Yeah. Well, as we know, there have been millions of people having. who have left the workforce, mm -hmm. so labor force participation is, is a real challenge. And I would argue, and our, our data and experience would indicate, if people are given a stake in the outcome and a voice in their work and some decision-making rights and they're treated with trust and respect, they're going to want to participate yep. in, in the labor market. So I'll give you one example, Ingersoll Rand, a public company, amazing leadership team. They shared ownership. When we bought the business, 86 people had ownership. Today, 16,000 people in 80 countries have ownership. And it's a meaningful amount of ownership. Mm -hmm. So those 16,000 colleagues, exclusive of management, I believe it's worth seven or $800 million today. The quit rate, this took 10 years. Okay. So I always want to stress- It takes a like, lot of time. This took 10 years. The leadership team got the quit rate down almost 90%. Wow. So that meant hiring 3,000 fewer people every year. So to your point on in a tight labor market, that's a win-win. Yes, which so many places are Great for workers, now. that's great for the company. Okay, let's talk about your, your day job. <laughs> Tell us a little bit, you know, the second half of 22, significant slowdown in private equity deals. What's your outlook for the year ahead? Give, it, give us just a little bit of a, what you're looking for, what's the environment like as we, as we look at the rest of the year? So deal flow is down. Um, it, it, um, from the perspective of people selling assets, you have a situation where a, a firm might have thought this investment is worth three and a half times our money. And suddenly now it's worth two times the money. So how much time has to pass before yeah. the firm says, you know what, two times our money is good too. Right, right. So there are fewer assets coming to market. And then on the, on the buy side, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. People are cautious. There's less debt available. There's less financing available. Interest rates are higher, so that's compressing what they can pay. So you've got a little bit of a stalemate where sellers remember the prices of a year ago. Buyers are living in the reality of today and looking at an uncertain future. So the market's going to be slow for a bit. I'm not, I'm not good at predicting the future. I would not expect 2023 from here to be very strong. You know, maybe the deal market picks up in the spring of next year. And you have a global role now, whereas you were running Americas before. Where are, are there bright spots anywhere? Where, where, where are you seeing the best outlook right now? We see, look, we see opportunity mm -hmm. everywhere. We're mm -hmm. continuing to be active in Europe, Asia, and the US across our traditional flagship private equity, our, our larger buyout business and growth equity. We have a mid-market business, we have a core vehicle. So, and we're finding ways to deploy it all. You know, in Asia, we've had a lot of success in Japan. Um, there's been a lot of carve out activity where large conglomerates have disposed of non-core assets. We've been a big beneficiary of that. We have a fantastic team. We're the clear market share leader there and deep, deep relationships because we've been in Japan a long time now. Um, but we also have done great in Korea. We still see a lot in, in China. I mean. Yes, there are regulatory challenges yep. and geopolitical concerns, mm -hmm. but over half the market is still very investable from our perspective. 
we've got a big business in Australia, New Zealand, India, Southeast Asia. So we see a lot of opportunity across Asia and same with Europe. There's still a lot to do. Again, globally, the market is a little slower, but we're still finding ways to deploy. And you're sharing this role. You're a co-head. Um, that is a model that I know works in some cases, but has felled many leaders too, to kind of try to share leadership. Um, what, why does it work at KKR? Well, the reason, as you note, I'm co-head of Global Private Equity with Nate Taylor. So Nate and I joined within a week or two of each other in 2005. So we've been at the firm a long time. We go way back. We go way back. He's one of my closest friends, period, put aside business. Okay, that helps. And when you have total trust in someone and there's no politics bet between you, which is easy to say, it's rare yeah. to have no kind of angling with each other and there's no competition, that's when it works. Because if it makes sense for Nate to go lead something without me, no problem. I'm not sitting there worried, what does this mean for me? Is Nate gonna get the spotlight? We just totally trust each other. We divide up the world in a super efficient way and we love working together and also have a ton of fun doing it. We laugh all the time, which so also- So that, that no ego and the trust, no, knowing like it's okay for him to go do that. But for the people who are not 20 year friends and are thrust into a position like that, what advice do you have? The advice I would have, and I don't know how you would do this without being as close as Nate and I are, is um, there just can't be daylight between the two of you. You just have to be aligned. You have to trust one another. I don't know how you maybe go to a trust building camp quickly or something. <laughs> You'd have to somehow have to build that. Build somehow. that. Yeah. Um, and that takes that takes a long time, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's tough if you haven't worked together. So it is, is it a setup, a leadership setup that you recommend when that does not exist already? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I would highly recommend it when you have what Nate and I have. Yeah, yeah. Because it's truly synergistic. It is truly additive.